b. Its integrity. We here use the term integrity to signify not merely completeness, but perfection. That which is perfect is, a fortiori, complete in all its parts. Christ's human nature was a. Supernaturally conceived, since the denial of his supernatural conception involves either a denial of the purity of Mary, his mother, or a denial of the truthfulness of Matthew's and Luke's narratives. Luke 1 verses 34 and 35, And Mary said unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the Most High shall overshadow thee. The seed of the woman, Genesis 3 verse 15, was one who had no earthly father. Eve equals life, not only as being the source of physical life to the race, but also as bringing into the world him who was to be its spiritual life. Julius Muller, Proof Texts, 29, Jesus Christ had no earthly father, his birth was a creative act of God, breaking through the chain of human generation. Dorna, Glaubenslayer, 2 447, SYST, Dopt, 3 345, the new science recognizes manifold methods of propagation, and that too even in one and the same species. Professor Lubb has found that the unfertilized egg of the sea urchin may be made by chemical treatment to produce thrifty young, and he thinks it probable that the same effect may be produced among the mammalia. Thus parthenogenesis in the highest order of life is placed among the scientific possibilities. Romans, even while he was an agnostic, affirmed that a virgin birth even in the human race would be by no means out of the range of possibility. See his Darwin and after Darwin, 119, footnote, even if a virgin has ever conceived and born a son, and even if such a fact in the human species has been unique, it would not betoken any breach of physiological continuity. Only a new impulse from the Creator could save the Redeemer from the long accruing fatalities of human generation. But the new creation of humanity in Christ is scientifically quite as possible as its first creation in Adam, and in both cases there may have been no violation of natural law, but only a unique revelation of its possibilities. Birth from a virgin made it clear that a new thing was taking place in the earth, and that one was coming into the world who was not simply man. A. B. Bruce, thoroughgoing naturalism excludes the virgin life as well as the virgin birth. C. Griffith Jones, Ascent Through Christ, 254-270, A. H. Strong, Christ in Creation, 176. Paul Lobstein, Incarnation of Our Lord, 217, that which is unknown to the teachings of St. Peter and St. Paul, St. John, and St. James, and Our Lord Himself, and is absent from the earliest and the latest Gospels, cannot be so essential as many people have supposed. This argument from silence is sufficiently met by the considerations that Mark passes over thirty years of our Lord's life in silence, that John presupposes the narratives of Matthew and of Luke, that Paul does not deal with the story of Jesus' life. The facts were known at first only to Mary and to Joseph, their very nature involved reticence until Jesus was demonstrated to be, the Son of God with power, by the resurrection from the dead, Romans 1 verse 4. Meantime the natural development of Jesus and his refusal to set up an earthly kingdom may have made the Miraculous events of thirty years ago seemed to Mary like a wonderful dream, so only gradually the marvelous tale of the Mother of the Lord found its way into the Gospel tradition and creeds of the Church, and into the inmost hearts of Christians of all countries, C. F. L. Anderson, in Baptist Review and Expositor, 1904 44 and Machen, on the N. T. Account of the Birth of Jesus, in Princeton Theol, Rev. October 1905, and January 1906. Cook, On the Virgin Birth of Our Lord, in Methodist Reverend, November. 1904-849-857, If there is a moral taint in the human race, if in the very blood and constitution of humanity there is an ineradicable tendency to sin, then it is utterly inconceivable that anyone born in the race by natural means should escape the taint of that race. And, finally, if the virgin birth is not historical, then a difficulty greater than any that destructive criticism has yet evolved from documents, interpolations, psychological improbabilities and unconscious contradictions confronts the reason, and upsets all the long results of scientific observation, that a sinful and deliberately sinning and unmarried pair should have given life to the purest human being that ever lived, or of whom the human race has ever dreamed, and that he, knowing and forgiving the sins of others, never knew the shame of his own origin. 
See also Gore, Dissertations, 1-68, on the virgin birth of our Lord, J. Armitage Robinson, Some Thoughts on the Incarnation, 42, both of whom show that without assuming the reality of the virgin birth, we cannot account for the origin of the narratives of Matthew and of Luke, nor for the acceptance of the virgin birth by the early Christians. Per contra, see Hoban, in Amjur, Theol, 1902 478-506, 709 to 752. For both sides of the controversy, see Symposium by Bacon, Zanos, Rees, and Warfield, in Amjur, Theol. January 1906 1 30, and especially or, Virgin Birth of Christ. b. Free, both from hereditary depravity, and from actual sin, as is shown by his never offering sacrifice, never praying for forgiveness. Teaching that all, but he needed the new birth, challenging all to convict him of a single sin. Jesus frequently went up to the temple, but he never offered sacrifice. He prayed, Father, forgive them, Luke 23 verse 34, but he never prayed, Father, forgive me. He said, Ye must be born anew, John 3 verse 7, but the words indicated that he had no such need. At no moment in all that life could a single detail have been altered, except for the worse. He not only yielded to God's will when made known to him, but he sought it, I seek not mine own will, but the will of him that sent me, John 5 verse 30. The anger which he showed was no passionate or selfish or vindictive anger, but the indignation of righteousness against hypocrisy and cruelty, an indignation accompanied with grief, looked round about on them with anger, being grieved at the hardening of their heart, Mark 3 verse 5. F. W. H. Myers, St. Paul, 19, 53, Thou with strong prayer and very much entreating willest be asked, and thou wilt answer then, show the hid heart beneath creation beating, smile with. Kind eyes and be a man with men. Yeah, through life, death, through sorrow and through sinning, he shall suffice me, for he has sufficed, Christ is the end, for Christ was the beginning, Christ the beginning, for the end is Christ. Not personal experience of sin, but resistance to it, fitted him to deliver us from it. Luke 1 verse 35, Wherefore also the holy thing which is begotten shall be called the Son of God, John 8 verse 46, Which of you convicteth me of sin? 1430, The prince of the world cometh, and he hath nothing in me, equals not the slightest evil inclination upon which his temptations can lay hold, Romans 8 verse 3, In the likeness of sinful flesh equals in flesh, but without the sin which in other men clings to the flesh. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, Him who knew no sin, Hebrews 4 verse 15, In all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin, 726, Holy, guileless, undefiled, separated from sinners, by the fact of his immaculate conception, 914, through the Eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish unto God, 1 Peter 1 verse 19, Precious blood, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, even the blood of Christ, 2.22, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, 1 John 3 verses 5 and 7, in him is no sin, he is righteous. Julius Muller, Proof Texts, 29, had Christ been only human nature, he could not have been without sin. But life can draw out of the putrescent clod materials for its own living. Divine life appropriates the human. Dorna, Glaubenslayer, 2-446, SYST, Doct. 3 to 344, what with us is regeneration, is with him the incarnation of God. In this origin of Jesus' sinlessness from his union with God, we see the absurdity, both doctrinally and practically, of speaking of an immaculate conception of the Virgin, and of making her sinlessness precede that of her Son. On the Roman Catholic doctrine of the immaculate conception of the Virgin, C. H. B. Smith, System, 389 to 392, Mason, Faith of the Gospel. 129 to 131, it makes the regeneration of humanity begin, not with Christ, but with the Virgin. It breaks his connection with the race. Instead of springing sinless from the sinful race, he derives his humanity from something not like the rest of us. Thomas Aquinas and Liguori both call Mary the Queen of Mercy, as Jesus her son is King of Justice, see Thomas, Praref, in September. Kathy P., comment on Esther, 5 3, and Liguori, Glories of Mary, 1 hours 80 minutes, Dublin version of 1866. Bradford, Heredity, 289, the Roman Church has almost apotheosized Mary, 
but it must not be forgotten that the process began with Jesus. From what he was, an inference was drawn concerning what his mother must have been. Christ took human nature in such a way that this nature, without sin, bore the consequences of sin. That portion of human nature which the Logos took into union with himself was, in the very instant and by the fact of his taking it, purged from all its inherent depravity. But if in Christ there was no sin, or tendency to sin, how could he be tempted? In the same way, we reply, that Adam was tempted. Christ was not omniscient, Mark 13 verse 32, of that day or that hour knoweth no one, not even the angels in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Only at the close of the first temptation does Jesus recognize Satan as the adversary of souls, Matt. For 10, get thee hence, Satan. Jesus could be. Tempted, not only because he was not omniscient, but also because he had the keenest susceptibility to all the forms of innocent desire. To these desires temptation may appeal. Sin consists, not in these desires, but in the gratification of them out of God's order, and contrary to God's will. Maya, lust is appetite run wild. There is no harm in any natural appetite, considered in itself. But appetite has been spoiled by the fall. So Satan appealed, Matt. For colon 1-11, to our Lord's desire for food, for applause, for power, to uberglorb, aberglorb, unglorb, Kurtz, compare to Matt. 26 colon 39, 27 colon 42, 26 colon 53. All temptation must be addressed either to desire or fear, so Christ was in all points tempted like as we are, Hebrews 4 verse 15. The first temptation, in the wilderness, was addressed to desire, the second, in the garden, was addressed to fear. Satan, after the first, departed from him for a season, Luke 4 verse 13, but he returned, in Jethsmane, the prince of the world cometh, and he hath nothing in me, John 14 verse 30, if possible, to deter Jesus from his work, by rousing within him vast and agonizing fears of the suffering and death that lay before him. Yet, in spite of both the desire and the fear with which his holy soul was moved, he was, without sin, Heb. For 15, the tree on the edge of the precipice is fiercely blown by the winds, the strain upon the roots is tremendous, but the roots hold. Even in Jethsmane and on Calvary, Christ never prays for forgiveness, he only imparts it to others. See Ullman, Sinlessness of Jesus, Timasius, Christi Person and Work, 2 colon 7-17. 126 to 136, especially 135, 136. Schaff, Person of Christ, 51 to 72, Shed, Dogm. Theol, 3 colon 330-349. C, Ideal Human Nature, Furnishing the Moral Pattern Which Man Is Progressively to Realize, Although Within Limitations of Knowledge and of Activity Required by His Vocation as the World's Redeemer. Psalm 8 verses 4 to 8, Thou hast made him but little lower than God, and crownest him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands, thou hast put all things under. His feet, a description of the ideal man, which finds its realization only in Christ. Hebrews 2 verses 6 to 10, But now we see not yet all things subjected to him. But we behold him who hath been made a little lower than the angels, even Jesus because of the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 45, the first. Adam. The last Adam, implies that the second Adam realized the full concept of humanity, which failed to be realized in the first Adam. So verse 49, as we have borne the image of the earthly, man, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly, man. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18, the glory of the Lord is the pattern, into whose likeness we are to be changed. Phil 321, who shall fashion anew the body of our humiliation, that it may be conformed to the body of his glory. Colossians 1 verse 18, that in all things he might have the preeminence, 1 Peter 2 verse 21, suffered for you, leaving you an example, that ye should follow his steps, 1 John 3 verse 3, every. One that hath this hope set on him purifieth himself, even as he is. Pure. The phrase, Son of Man, John 5 verse 27, compare to Dan 7 13, Commander of Pusey, in Loco, and Westcott, in Bible Commander on John, 32-35, seems to intimate that Christ answers to the perfect idea of humanity, 
as it at first existed in the mind of God. Not that he was surpassingly beautiful in physical form, for the only way to reconcile the seemingly conflicting intimations is to suppose that in all outward respects he took our average humanity, at one time appearing without form or comeliness, is, 52 colon 2, and aged before his time, John 8 verse 57, thou art not yet fifty years old, at another time revealing so much of his inward grace and glory that men were attracted and awed, Psalms 45 verse 2, thou art fairer than the children of men. Luke 4 verse 22, the words of grace which proceeded out of his mouth, Mark 10 verse 32, Jesus was going before them, and they were amazed, and they that followed were afraid, Matt. 17-1-8, the account of the transfiguration. Compare the Byzantine. Pictures of Christ with those of the Italian painters, the former ascetic. And emaciated, the latter types of physical well-being. Modern pictures make Jesus too exclusively a Jew. Yet there is a certain truth in the words of Mozumda, Jesus was an Oriental, and we Orientals. Understand him. He spoke in figure. We understand him. He was a mystic. You take him literally, you make an Englishman of him. So Japanese Christians will not swallow the Western system of theology, because they say that this would be depriving the world of the Japanese view of Christ. But in all spiritual respects Christ was perfect. In him are united all the excellences of both the sexes, of all temperaments and nationalities and characters. He possesses, not simply passive innocence, but positive and absolute holiness, triumphant through temptation. He includes in himself all objects and reasons for affection and worship, so that, in loving him, love can never love too much. Christ's human nature, therefore, and not human nature as it is in us, is the true basis of ethics and of theology. This absence of narrow individuality, this ideal, universal manhood, could not have been secured by merely natural laws of propagation, it was secured by Christ's miraculous conception, see Dorna, Glaubenslayer, 2 446, SYST, Doct, 3 344. John G. Whittier, on the Birmingham philanthropist, Joseph Sturge, tender as woman, manliness and meekness in him were so allied, that they who judged him by his strength or weakness saw but a single side. Seth, Ethical Principles, 420, The secret of the power of the moral ideal is the conviction which it carries with it that it is no mere ideal, but the expression of the supreme reality. Bown, Theory of Thought and Knowledge, 364, The a priorianly outlines a possible, and does not determine what shall be actual within the limits of the possible. If experience is to be possible, it must take on certain forms, but those forms are compatible with an infinite variety of experience. No a priori truths or ideals can guarantee Christianity. We want a historical basis, an actual Christ, a realization of the divine ideal. Great men, says Amiel, are the true men. Yes, we add, but only Christ, the greatest man, shows what the true man is. The heavenly perfection of Jesus discloses to us the greatness of our own possible being, while at the same time it reveals our infinite shortcoming and the source from which all restoration must come. Gore, Incarnation, 168, Jesus Christ is the Catholic man. In a sense, all the greatest men have overlapped the boundaries of their time. The truly great have all one age, and from one visible space shared influence. They, both in power and act are permanent, and time is not with them, save as it worketh for them, they in it. But in a unique sense the manhood of Jesus is Catholic, because it is exempt, not from the limitations which belong to manhood but from the limitations which make our manhood narrow and isolated, merely local or national. Dale, Ephesians, 42, Christ is a servant and something more. There is an ease, a freedom, a grace, about his doing the will of God, which can belong only to a son. There is nothing constrained, he was born to it. He does the will of God as a child does the will of its father, naturally, as a matter of course, almost without thought. No irreverent familiarity about his communion with the father, but also no. Trace of fear, or even of wonder. Prophets had fallen to the ground. When the divine glory was revealed to them, but Christ stands calm and erect. A subject may lose his self-possession in the presence of his prince, but not a son. Mason, Faith of the Gospel, 148, What once he had perceived, he thenceforth knew. He had no opinions, no conjectures, we are never told that he forgot, nor even that he remembered, 
which would imply a degree of forgetting, we are not told that he arrived at truths by the process of reasoning them out, but he reasons them out for others. It is not recorded that he took counsel or formed plans, but he desired, and he purposed, and he did one thing with a view to another. On Christ, as the ideal man, see Griffith Jones, Ascent Through Christ, 307-336, f. W. Robertson, Sermon on the Glory of the Divine Son, 2nd Series, Sermon 19, Wilberforce, Incarnation, 22-99, Ebrard, Dogmatic, 225, Moorhouse, Nature and Revelation, 37, Tennyson, Introduction to In Memoriam, For All, Life of Christ, 1 148 154, and 2, Excursus 4, Bushnell, Nature and the Supernatural, 276 332, Thomas Hughes, The Manliness of Christ, Hopkins, Scriptural Idea of Man, 121 145, Tyler, in Bibsack, 2251, 620, Dorna, Glaubenslayer, 2 451 square. D. A human nature that found its personality only in union with the divine nature, in other words, a human nature impersonal, in the sense that it had no personality separate from the divine nature, and prior to its union therewith. By the impersonality of Christ's human nature, we mean only that it had no personality before Christ took it, no personality before its union with the divine. It was a human nature whose consciousness and will were developed only in union with the personality of the Logos. The fathers therefore rejected the word, and substituted the word, they favored not unpersonality but impersonality. In still plainer terms, the Logos did not take into union with himself an already developed human person, such as James, Peter, or John, but human nature before it had become personal or was capable of receiving a name. It reached its personality only in union with his own divine nature. Therefore we see in Christ not two persons, a human person and a divine person, but one person, and that person possessed of a human nature as well as of a divine. For proof of this, see pages 683 to 700, also shed, dogm. Theol, 2 308 Mason, Faith of the Gospel, 136, We count it no defect in our bodies that they have no personal subsistence apart from ourselves, and that, if separated from ourselves, they are nothing. They share in a true personal life because we, whose bodies they are, are persons. What happens to them happens to us. In a similar manner the personality of the Logos furnished the organizing principle of Jesus' twofold nature. As he looked backward he could see himself dwelling in eternity with God, so far as his divine nature was concerned. But as respects his humanity he could remember that it was not eternal, it had had its beginnings in time. Yet this humanity had never had a separate personal existence, its personality had been developed only in. Connection with the Divine Nature Goschel, quoted in Dorna's Person of Christ, 5 170, Christ is humanity, we have it, he is it entirely we participate therein. His personality proceeds and lies at the basis of the personality of the race and its individuals. As idea, he is implanted in the whole of humanity, he lies at the basis of every human consciousness, without however attaining realization in an individual, for this is only possible in the entire race at the end of the times. Emma Marie Calliard, On Man in the Light of Evolution, in Contemp. Reverend, December 1893, 873-881, Christ is not only the goal of the race which is to be conformed to him, but he is also the vital principle which molds each individual of that race into its own similitude. The perfect type exists potentially through all the intermediate stages by which it is more and more nearly approached, and, if it did not exist, neither could they. There could be no development of an absent life. The goal of man's evolution, the perfect type of manhood, is Christ. He exists and always has existed potentially in the race and in the individual, equally before as after his visible incarnation, equally in the millions of those who do not, as in the far fewer millions of those who do, bear his name. In the strictest sense of the words, he is the life of man, and that in a far deeper and more intimate sense than he can be said to be the life of the universe. Dale Christian Fellowship, 159, Christ's Incarnation was not an isolated and abnormal wonder. It was God's witness to the true and ideal relation of all men to God. The Incarnation was no detached event, it was the issue of an eternal process of utterance on the part of the Word, 
whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting, Micah 5 colon 2. E, a human nature germinal, and capable of self-communication, so constituting him the spiritual head and beginning of a new race, the second Adam from whom fallen man individually and collectively derives new and holy life. In his, 9 colon 6, Christ is called everlasting father. In his, 53 colon 10, it is said that, he shall see his seed. In Revelation 22 verse 16, he calls himself, the root as well as, the offspring of David. See also John 5.21, the Son also giveth life to whom he will, 15 colon 1, I am the true vine, whose roots are planted in heaven, not on earth, the vine man, from whom as its stock the new life of humanity is to spring, and into whom the half-withered branches of the old humanity are to be grafted that they may have life divine. See Trench, Sermon on Christ, the True Vine, in Hulsean Lectures. John 17 verse 2, Thou gavest him authority over all flesh, that to all whom thou hast given him, he should give eternal life. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 45, The last Adam became a life-giving spirit, here, spirit equals not the Holy Spirit, nor Christ's divine nature, but, the ego of his total divine human personality. Ephesians 5 verse 23, Christ also is the head of the church, equals the head to which all the members are united, and from which they derive life and power. Christ calls the disciples his, little children, John 13 verse 33, when he leaves them they are, orphans, 14 18 Mark. He represents himself as a father of children, no less than as a brother, 2017, my brethren, compare to Hebrews 2 verse 11, brethren, and 13, behold, I and the children whom God hath given me, see Westcott, commander on John 13 33. The new race is propagated after the analogy of the old, the first Adam is the source of the physical, the second Adam of spiritual, life, the first Adam the source of corruption, the second of holiness. Hence John 12 verse 24, if it die, it beareth much fruit, Matt. 10:37 and Luke 14 26, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, equals none is worthy of me, who prefers his old natural ancestry to his new spiritual descent and relationship. Thus Christ is not simply the noblest embodiment of the old humanity, but also the fountainhead and beginning of a new humanity, the new source of life for the race. Compare to 1 Timothy 2 verse 15, she shall be saved through the childbearing, which brought Christ into the world. See Wilberforce, Incarnation, 227-241, Baird, Elohim Revealed. 638 to 664, Dorna, Glaubenslayer, 2 451 square. SYST, docked, 3 349 square. Lightfoot on Colossians 1 verse 18, who is the beginning, the fruits from the dead, here equals 1. Priority in time. Christ was first fruits of the dead, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 20 and 23, 2. Originating power, not only principium principiatum, but also principium principiens. As he is first with respect to the universe, so he becomes first with respect to the church. Compare to Hebrews 7 verses 15 and 16, another priest, who hath been made, not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. Dot. Paul teaches that the head of every man is Christ, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3, and that, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, Colossians 2 verse 9. Whiteun, Gloria Patri, 88-92, remarks on Ephesians 1 verse 10, that God's purpose is, to sum up all things in Christ, the things in the heavens, and the things upon the earth, to bring all things to a head. History is a perpetually increasing incarnation of life, whose climax and crown is the divine fullness of life in Christ. In him the before unconscious sonship of the world awakes to consciousness of the Father. He is worthiest to bear the name of the Son of God, in a preeminent, but not exclusive right. We agree with these words of Waitun, if they mean that Christ is the only giver of life to man as he is the only giver of life to the universe. Hence Christ is the only ultimate authority in religion. He reveals himself in nature, in man, in history, in scripture, but each of these is only a mirror which reflects him to us. In each case the mirror is more or less blurred and the image obscured, yet heat pairs in the mirror notwithstanding. The mirror is useless unless there is an eye to look into it, and an object to be seen in it. 
The Holy Spirit gives the eyesight, while Christ himself, living and present, furnishes the object. James 1 colon 23-25, 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18, 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12. Over against mankind is Christ kind, over against the fallen and sinful race is the new race created by Christ's indwelling. Therefore only when he ascended with his perfected manhood could he send the Holy Spirit, for the Holy Spirit which makes men children of God is the Spirit of Christ. Christ's humanity now, by virtue of its perfect union with deity, has become universally communicable. It is as consonant with evolution to derive spiritual gifts from the second Adam, a solitary source, as it is to derive the natural man from the first Adam, a solitary source, see George Harris, Moral Evolution, 409, an A. H. Strong, Christ in Creation, 174. Simon, Reconciliation, 308, Every man is in a true sense essentially of divine nature, even as Paul teaches, Act 17 verse 29. At the center, as it were, in swathed in fold after fold, after the manner of a bulb, we discern the living divine spark, impressing us qualitatively if not quantitatively, with the absoluteness of the great sun to which it belongs. The idea of truth, beauty, right, has in it an absolute and divine quality. It comes from God, yet from the depths of our own nature. It is the evidence that Christ, the light that lighteth every man, John 1 verse 9, is present and is working within us. Phlydra, Philos, of religion, 1 272, that the divine idea of man as, the son of his love, Colossians 1 verse 13, and of humanity as the kingdom of this son of God, is the imminent final cause of all existence and development even in the prior world of nature. This has been the fundamental thought of the Christian Gnosis since the Apostolic Age, and I think that no philosophy has yet been able to shake or to surpass this thought, the cornerstone of an idealistic view of the world. But Mead, Ritchell's place in the history of doctrine, 10, says of Phlydra and Ritchell, both recognize Christ as morally perfect and as the head of the Christian Church. Both deny his pre-existence and his essential deity. Both reject the traditional conception of Christ as an atoning redeemer. Ritchell calls Christ God, though inconsistently, Phlydra declines to say one thing when he seems to mean another. The passages here alluded to abundantly confute the descetic denial of Christ's veritable human body, and the Apollinarian denial of Christ's veritable human soul. More than this, they establish the reality and integrity of Christ's human nature, as possessed of all the elements, faculties, and powers essential to humanity.